The joint session will come to order. The chair appoints as members of the committee on the part of the House to escort the President of the United States into the chamber. The gentleman from Louisiana, Mr. Scalise. The gentleman from Minnesota, Mr. Emmer. The gentlewoman from New York, Ms. Stefanik. The gentleman from North Carolina, Mr. Hudson. The gentleman from Alabama, Mr. Palmer. The gentleman from Utah, Mr. Moore. The gentlewoman from Michigan, Mrs. McLean. The House will be in order. The House will be in order. The gentleman from Oklahoma, Mr. Cole. The gentleman from Pennsylvania, Mr. Reschenthaler. The gentleman from Kentucky, Mr. Rogers. The gentleman from New York, Mr. Jeffries. The gentlewoman from Massachusetts, Ms. Clark. The gentlewoman or gentleman from California, Mr. Aguilar. The gentleman from California, Mr. Liu. The gentlewoman from Washington, Ms. Del Bene. The gentleman from Colorado, Mr. Nagoose. The gentlewoman from Illinois, Ms. Underwood. The gentlewoman from Texas, Ms. Escobar. The gentlewoman from Massachusetts, Ms. Trahan. The gentleman from Michigan, Mr. Kildee. The President of the Senate, at the direction of that body, appoints the following senators as members of the committee on the part of the, pres of the Senate to escort the President of the United States into the House chamber. The Senator from New York, Mr. Schumer. The Senator from Illinois, Mr. Durbin. The Senator from Washington, Mrs. Murray. The Senator from Michigan, Ms. Stabenow. The Senator from Minnesota, Ms. Klobuchar. The Senator from Virginia, Mr. Warner. The Senator from Wisconsin, Ms. Baldwin. The Senator from Kentucky, Mr. McConnell. The Senator from South Dakota, Mr. Thune. The Senator from Wyoming, Mr. Barrasso. The Senator from West Virginia, Mrs. Capito. And the Senator from Iowa, Ms. Ernst. The members of the escort committee will exit the chamber through the lobby doors. Mr. Speaker, the Dean of the Diplomatic Corps.
Chief Justice and Associate Justices of the Supreme Court. From the Associated Press, this is the State of the Union Address, live from the nation's capital. Welcome to the Associated Press's coverage of the State of the Union. It's a dramatic night at the U.S. Capitol, and expectations are running pretty high for President Joe Biden's speech. I'm Josh Boak with the AP. President Biden tonight faces a major moment in presidential stagecraft. He goes into the speech with six in 10 Americans, according to AP NORC polling, saying that he lacks the mental capability to be president. This is a moment in an election year for Biden to prove himself. He has the chance to talk about money for Ukraine, aid to Gaza, the US economy, and his vision for what a second term would be and the differences between his agenda and those of congressional Republicans. Let's take a look right now on the House floor. As you'll see, members are there. They've been shaking hands, hugs. There's been a few slaps in the shoulder. They are getting ready for the big show. Many women lawmakers are dressed in white for this moment. Don't forget, reproductive rights are going to be a major element of President Biden's speech. And we see on the rostrum Speaker Johnson and Vice President Kamala Harris. 
as they wait for President Biden to come. Now, President Biden is going to bring a major focus to this speech about the U.S. economy. According to excerpts released by the White House, Biden will say this is the greatest story never told to many Americans. Why is that? Well, Biden's going to say that under his presidency, he's added roughly 15 million jobs. That's a record for any president. Many Republicans will push back against that, saying those jobs were naturally going to come back as the economy recovered from the pandemic. Secondly, is going to point out the unemployment rate at 3.7%. That's a serious drop since when he took office. And he's also going to discuss inflation. Now, inflation is down at about 3.1%. It had peaked at 9.1% in the summer of 2022. And that really hurt the president's approval rating. And he still knows that Americans are struggling with the cost of housing and groceries. And we see in these numbers that many Americans are not satisfied by his economic leadership. Just 34% approve. So tonight is the opportunity for the president to try to bring the country over to his side, to see things his way as he believes the country is faring. It is a chance for him in an election year to go after his likely competitor in this year's election, Republican Donald Trump, the former president, a possible rematch of the 2020 election. Now, according to aides, Biden is not going to say Trump's name. He's going to talk about his predecessor. He's going to talk about someone else who is similarly his age. Biden is 81, Trump is 77. He wants to draw that contrast on what it means to govern responsibly, on what it means to have a sense of optimism about where the country is and where it could go. This is his chance to try to define Trump and reintroduce Trump's administration to voters. Now, Republicans will then be able to follow with Alabama Senator Katie Britt delivering the GOP response. According to excerpts from her, she's going to make inflation a major focus and just say that families are not earning enough to get by in an era of higher prices. Biden spent a lot of time working on this speech. He huddled with aides at Camp David, trying to figure out what the perfect tone would be, trying to show both his compassion and his drive. Aides are saying tonight will be a moment of high energy for the president because he needs to be able to convince the country that he deserves another four years. The event itself is one of tremendous spectacle. Historically, State of the Unions were nothing big. Many presidents just delivered them in paper form, submitting it, it to Congress to be read. That began to change around 1923, when the first State of the Union was given as a radio address by Calvin Coolidge. By 1947, it expanded to TV with Harry Truman. And what we see now is a State of the Union address in which many people will be watching it over the internet, and not necessarily the entirety of it. They'll see it in clips, in bits, in memes. And that's why one of the elements to watch for tonight is not just the totality of the speech, but the ability of President Biden to generate and create moments. What kind of moments could we see? Well, in last year's State of the Union address, President Biden specifically challenged Republicans to not cut Social Security or Medicare benefits. When he suggested they would, they began to boo him, and he got them in an impromptu moment to agree to protect both programs and then get a standing ovation, something that's very rare in these highly polarized times. If we go back and look at what's going on right now at the House chamber, we can see that lawmakers are starting to stare at their phones. They're looking for updates as they wait for the president to arrive. This is a moment that is being built with anticipation and anticipation and anticipation.
one thing to look for tonight is also to see which applause lines resonate the most. The president, according to his aides, is really trying to frame this as a question of who is on your side? Who's fighting for you? The middle class, union workers, senior citizens, children, and especially women. If you look at the guests tonight, many of them are involved in the reproductive rights issue, whether that's IVF or abortion. And this is an intentional strategy by the White House because they've said they want to resume the protections in Roe versus Wade. As many people know, the Supreme Court in 2022 overturned Roe versus Wade, allowing states to set their own course on what abortion uh, should be and could be. President Biden sees this not only as an issue of fundamental rights, but politically a way for him to galvanize voters. Republicans are going to have to find ways to push back against him on this. And one thing we might look for is when there are moments for cooperation and when there are moments of major disputes. Right now, President Biden has been unable to provide roughly $60 billion in aid to Ukraine as House Republicans have rejected measures that have passed the Senate. Why does this matter? Ukraine is running low on munitions without that aid. Estimates are that Russia basically has the equivalent of five bullets for every one that Ukraine has. As the National Security Advisor Jake Sullivan said, right now Ukrainian troops aren't at a loss for courage, they're at a loss for weapons. And that's why this measure really matters if the United States is going to be willing to confront Russia in Ukraine. It is also a chance for the United States to show its partnership with the European Union and NATO. In the audience tonight for the president's speech is the prime minister of Sweden. Sweden just joined NATO as a member. Putin's invasion of the Ukraine caused countries like Sweden. Oh, and we can see Jill Biden is entering right now. That's the first lady to applause. She's seated next to the Prime Minister of Sweden, who's there. Sweden and Finland have both uh, are in the process of joining NATO. NATO has expanded because of Russia's invasion of Ukraine. And Biden sees it as being stronger than ever, as well as the United States relationships with other countries, both in the EU as well as in Mr. Asia. Mr. Speaker, the President's Cabinet. The chamber is now waiting for the President's arrival. And we see members of his cabinet coming. That's Secretary of State Antony Blinken out first. He's followed by Treasury Secretary Janet Yellen. Behind them is Defense Secretary Lloyd Austin and then Attorney General Merrick Garland. Some of you might remember that Defense Secretary Lloyd Austin recently had surgery uh, for cancer, but did not inform the White House of that, something that caused tremendous consternation with members of Congress. But we're not seeing any residual frustration or anger as he walked down the aisle tonight. More cabinet members are making their way down. And once again, we're seeing warm greetings, particularly from the Democratic side. This is a chance for Democrats, which is a which happen to have a very large and broad base, but a very diverse base that it sometimes finds differences with each other. This is a chance for them to come together. And that's what they're trying to do tonight. We see Pete Buttigieg, the Transportation Secretary and Energy Secretary Jennifer Granholm uh, uh, coming down as well. Buttigieg, of course, ran for president against Biden in 2020 and managed to win the Iowa caucuses. And then behind Granholm is someone very important. That is Alejandro Mayorkas, the Secretary of uh, uh, DHS. 
he was recently uh, the subject of an impeachment effort by the House. The House took two efforts in order to impeach him, and that means Mayorkas' trial could go before the Senate. Behind Mayorkas is the White House Chief of Staff, Jeff Zients. Zients has been building up expectations for tonight, saying that Biden is going to come out with a sense of passion. Near Zients is the Veterans Affairs Secretary, Dennis McDonough, who had been the Chief of Staff during Barack Obama's presidency. Getting hugs in the middle of the screen is OMB Director Shalanda Yun. Shalanda Yun is one of those math gurus inside the White House who happened to negotiate this past summer how to raise the debt ceiling, all while taking care of her daughter in daycare. Um, she is going to be on the hot seat in the next week as the White House launches its budget proposal and continues to negotiate with Congress over issues like funding. We're still waiting for several cabinet members to find their seats. This is a slow and gradual process that, as is often the case when the president speaks, is not necessarily running on schedule because this is a moment almost like a reunion of glad handing, a chance to just say hi and wish each other well. Out at the far left on the screen, you can see West Virginia Senator Joe Manchin. Manchin has been one of the major players during Biden's tenure. He's not running for re-election because West Virginia has increasingly turned Republican. But it was Manchin who helped put together deals like the Inflation Reduction Act, which allowed for investment in renewable energy and might be one of the major subjects that Biden will bring up tonight. He's blocked on screen ever so slightly, but there is Utah Senator Mitt Romney, who was just talking to Manchin. Romney is also not seeking re-election. And the fact that so many people are leaving Congress, who are thought of as being able to work together in a bipartisan sense, tells you a lot about the frustration that many lawmakers feel and how challenging it could be for anyone to bring a country this politically polarized together and find the incentives to do so. Members are still speaking and waiting to get to their seats as we await President Biden's arrival. Last year when Biden spoke, the speech went about an hour and 13 minutes. Many State of the Union addresses tend to run an hour, give or take 10 or 15 minutes. President Bill Clinton has the longest uh, delivered State of the Union speech on record. Although Jimmy Carter in 1981 delivered a State of the Union that was more than 30,000 words, but since he'd recently lost the election, he didn't bother to speak. He just submitted it in paper form to Congress. Mr. Speaker, the President of the, the United State of States. And here comes President Biden. You can see him getting a lot of applause from Democrats in the chamber. Speaker Johnson is also standing up there and applauding for the President as he very slowly makes his way down the aisle as he greets members. This is a really comfortable space for President Biden. He came to the Senate from Delaware in 1972. He spent most of his adult life in the U.S. Capitol as a senator for Delaware. He thinks of himself often in those terms still to this day when he thinks about what his policies mean for constituents. He even reads local Delaware newspapers and sends 
letters and congratulatory notes to people he reads about in them. So again, this is a man at home in the U.S. Capitol who's made plenty of speeches here. In fact, back in 1983, when he was a senator, he delivered the Democratic response to Ronald Reagan's State of the Union. It was a very unique response in that Biden did so without his suit jacket on and standing up in his office. He had his aides working behind him as he spoke, and he literally did a walk and talk like what you would see in the TV show The West Wing decades later. And his big point was very similar to what he might talk about tonight, that he needed an economy with opportunity and fairness for workers. And in doing that, he channeled the Great Depression era president, Franklin D. Roosevelt, saying, quote, it can be done. Tonight is a chance for him to prove that that's still possible. You see, Biden is still greeting more lawmakers. Behind him is uh, Chuck Schumer, the New York senator and the Democratic leader in the Senate. Biden is going in for hugs and kisses. Again, he is with Democrats who know that he is their choice in 2024. Biden has faced little opposition in the Democratic primaries despite concerns about his 81 years from voters. Right in front of Biden right now is Republican Marjorie Taylor Greene of Georgia, who's holding up her phone and appears to be saying something to him while wearing a Make America Great Again hat and what appears to be a t-shirt supportive of former Republican President Donald Trump. And we can see that Biden is posing for more selfies. He's become something of a selfie aficionado when he's out on the road. That's become one of his major ways of interacting with supporters at speeches and rallies once COVID restrictions lifted. Sometimes after remarks, he can take 20, 30, even 40 minutes with people just getting those selfies. And there's Biden with Manchin, the West Virginia Senator, and Mitt Romney, the 2012 Republican nominee for president, who will be leaving the Senate for Utah. The president is taking this moment, even taking hold of other people's phones just to get the shot right. Not many people have had a chance to see the president work his own iPhone, but I have. He has his photos neatly organized of his family and is remarkably adept at a touch screen.
And now he's going to be members of the Supreme Court. That's Justice Sonia Sotomayor. Next to her is Justice Elena Kagan. He's saying hi to Justice Neil Gorsuch and Justice Brett Kavanaugh. Biden, of course, during his time in the Senate, was one of, the, for a period, the chairs of the Senate Judiciary Committee, which gets to uh, deal with the confirmation process for nominations to the Supreme Court. And now he's talking to his military advisors. Again, Biden is taking his time. This is his chance to show how presidential he can be. You can see him right now. He just greeted Vermont Senator Bernie Sanders we ran against in the 2020 Democratic primary contest. Next to Sanders is Georgia Senator Raphael Warnock. And with that, he's coming to the roster. Good evening. Good evening. If I were smart, I'd go home now. <laughs> Mr. Speaker, Madam Vice President, members of Congress, my fellow Americans, in January, 1941, Franklin Roosevelt came to this chamber to speak to the nation, and he said, I address you at a moment unprecedented in the history of the Union. Hitler was on the march. War was raging in Europe. President Roosevelt's purpose was to wake up Congress and alert the American people that this was no ordinary time. Freedom and democracy were under assault in the world. Tonight, I come to this same chamber to address the nation. Now it's we who face an unprecedented moment in the history of the Union. And yes, my purpose tonight is to wake up the Congress and alert the American people that this is no ordinary moment either. Not since President Lincoln and the Civil War have freedom and democracy been under assault at home as they are today. What makes our moment rare is that freedom and democracy are under attack at, both at home and overseas at the very same time. <clears throat> overseas, Putin of Russia is on the march, invading Ukraine and sowing chaos throughout Europe and beyond. If anybody in this room thinks Putin will stop at Ukraine, I assure you he will not.
but Ukraine, Ukraine can stop Putin. Ukraine can stop Putin if we stand with Ukraine and provide the weapons that needs to defend itself. That is all. That is all Ukraine is asking. They're not asking for American soldiers. In fact, there are no American soldiers at war in Ukraine, and I'm determined to keep it that way. But now, assistance to Ukraine is being blocked by those who want to walk away from our world leadership. It wasn't long ago when a Republican president named Ronald Reagan thundered, Mr. Gorbachev, tear down this wall. Now, now my predecessor, a former Republican president tells Putin, quote, do whatever the hell you want. That's a quote. A former president actually said that, bowing down to a Russian leader, I think it's outrageous, it's dangerous, and it's unacceptable. <laughs> America is a founding member of NATO. The military alliance of democratic nations created after World War II prevent, to prevent war and keep the peace. And today, we've made NATO stronger than ever. We welcomed Finland to the alliance last year. And just this morning, Sweden officially joined, and their minister is here tonight. We're going to stand up. Welcome. Welcome, welcome, welcome. And they know how to fight. Mr. Prime Minister, welcome to NATO, the strongest military alliance the world has ever seen. I say this to Congress. We have to stand up to Putin. Send me a bipartisan national security bill. History is literally watching. History is watching. If the United States walks away, it will put Ukraine at risk. Europe is at risk. The free world will be at risk, emboldening others to do what they wish to do us harm. My message to President Putin, who I've known for a long time, is simple. We will not walk away. We will not bow down. not bow down. In a literal sense, history is watching. History is watching. Just like history watched three years ago on January 6th, when insurrection stormed this very capital and placed a dagger to the throat of American democracy. Many of you are here on that darkest of days. We all saw with our own eyes the insurrectionists were not patriots. They'd come to stop the peaceful transfer of power, to overturn the will of the people. January 6 lies about the 2020 election and the plots to steal the election posed a great, gravest threat to U.S. democracy since the Civil War. But they failed. America stood. America stood strong, and democracy prevailed. We must be honest. The threat to democracy must be defended. My predecessor and some of you here seek to bury the truth about January 6th. I will not do that. This is the moment to speak the truth and to bury the lies. Here's the simple truth. You can't love your country only when you win.
as I've done ever since being elected to office, I ask all of you, without regard to party, to join together and defend democracy. Remember your oath of office is defending against all threats, foreign and domestic. Respect. Respect free and fair elections. Restore trust in our institutions. And make clear political violence has absolutely no place, no place in America, zero place. Again, it's not, it's not hyperbole to suggest history is watching. We're watching. Your children and grandchildren will read about this day and what we do. History is watching another assault on freedom. Joining us tonight is Latoya Beasley, a social worker from Birmingham, Alabama. Fourteen months ago, fourteen months ago, she and her husband welcomed a baby girl thanks to the miracle of IVF. She scheduled treatments to have that second child, but the Alabama Supreme Court shut down IVF treatments across the state, unleashed by a Supreme Court decision overturning Roe v. Wade. She was told her dream would have to wait. What her family had got through should never have happened. Unless Congress acts, it could happen again. So tonight, let's stand up for families like hers. To my friends across the aisle, don't keep this waiting any longer. Guarantee the right to ABF. Guarantee it nationwide. Like most Americans, I believe Roe v. Wade got it right. I thank Vice President Harris for being an incredible leader, defending reproductive freedom, and so much more. Thank you. My predecessor came to office determined to see Roe v. Wade overturned. He's the reason it was overturned, and he brags about it. Look at the chaos. That has resulted. Joining us tonight is Kate Cox, the wife and mother from Dallas. She's become pregnant again and had a fetus of a fatal condition. Her doctor told Kate that her own life and her ability to have future in the children in the future were at risk if she didn't act. Because Texas law banned her ability to act, Kate and her husband had to leave the state to get what she needed. What her family got through should have never happened as well, but it's happening in too many others. There are state laws banning the freedom to choose, criminalizing doctors, forcing survivors of rape and incest to leave their states to get the treatment they need. Many of you in this chamber and my predecessor are promising to pass a national ban on reproductive freedom. My God, what freedom else would you take away? Look. It's a decision to overturn Roe v. Wade. The Supreme Court majority wrote the following, and with all due respect, Justices, women are not without electoral, electoral power. Uh, excuse me, electoral or political power. You're about to realize just how much you get right about that. about overturning Roe v. Wade have no clue about the power of women. But they found out when reproductive freedom was on the ballot, we won in 2022 and 2020, and we'll win again in 2024. <clears throat> if you, if you, the American people, Send me a Congress that supports the right to choose. I promise you, I'll restore Roe v. Wade as the law of the land again. <laughs> Folks, America cannot go back. I'm here to, tonight to show what I believe is the way forward, because I know how far we come. Four years ago next week, before I came to office, the country was hit by the worst pandemic and the worst economic crisis in a century. Remember the fear? Record losses? 
Remember the spikes in crime and the murder rate, raging virus that took more than one million American lives of loved ones, millions left behind? A mental health crisis of isolation and loneliness. A president, my predecessor, failed the most basic presidential duty that he owes to American people, the duty to care. I think that's unforgivable. I came to office determined to get us through one of the toughest periods in the nation's history. We have. It doesn't make new, but in a news in a thousand cities and towns, the American people are writing the greatest comeback story never told. <laughs> so let's tell the story here. Tell it here and now. America's comeback is building the future of American possibilities, building an economy from the middle out and the bottom up, not the top down, investing in all America, in all Americans, to make every sure everyone has a fair shot and we leave no one, no one behind. The pandemic no longer controls our lives. The vaccine that saved us from COVID are now being used to beat cancer, turning setback into comeback. That's what America does. That's what America does. <laughs> Folks, my inherited economy is on the brink. Now our economy is literally the envy of the world. 15 million new jobs in just three years, a record, a record. <laughs> Unemployment at 50-year lows. A record 16 million Americans are starting small businesses, and each one is a literal act of hope. With historic job growth and small business growth for Black and Hispanics and Asian Americans, 800,000 new manufacturing jobs in America and counting. Where is it written we can't be the manufacturing capital of the world? We are, we will. More people have health insurance today. More people have health insurance today than ever before. The racial wealth gap is as small as it's been in 20 years. Wages keep going up. Inflation keeps coming down. Inflation has dropped from 9 percent to 3 percent, the lowest in the world, and tending lower. The landing is and will be soft. And now, instead of importing, importing foreign products and exporting American jobs, we're exporting American products and creating American jobs right here in America, where they belong. And it takes time, but the American people are beginning to feel it. Consumer studies show consumer confidence is soaring. Buy America has been the law of the land since the 1930s. Past administrations, including my pre predecessor, including some Democrats as well in the past, failed to buy American. Not anymore. On my watch, federal projects that you fund, like helping build American roads, bridges, and highways, will be made with American products and built by American workers. creating good-paying American jobs. And thanks to our Chips and Science Act, the United States is investing more in research and development than ever before. During the pandemic, a shortage of semiconductors, chips, that drove up the price of everything from cell phones to automobiles. And by the way, we invented those chips right here in America. Well, instead of having to import them, Instead of we, private companies are now investing billions of dollars to build new chip factories here in America, creating tens of thousands of jobs, many of those jobs paying $100,000 a year and don't require a college degree. <laughs> in fact, my policies have attracted $650 billion in private sector investment in clean energy, advanced manufacturing, creating tens of thousands of jobs here in America. <clears throat> and thanks, and thanks to our bipartisan infrastructure law, 
46,000 new projects have been announced all across your communities. And by the way, I noticed some of you have strongly voted against it, or they're cheering on that money coming in. I like it. I'm with you. I'm with you. And if any of you don't want that money in your district, just let me know. <laughs> Modernize our roads and bridges, ports and airports, public transit systems. Removing po poisonous lead pipes so every child can drink clean water without risk of brain damage. <clears throat> Providing affordable, affordable high-speed internet for every American, no matter where you live, urban, suburban, or rural communities, in red states and blue states. Record investments in tribal communities because of my investment in family farms. Because I invested in family farms led by my sector of agriculture, who knows more about this than anybody I know. We're better able to stay in the family for the, those farms for the, and their children and grandchildren won't have to leave, leave home to make a living. It's transformative. The great comeback story is Belvedere, Illinois, home to an auto plant for nearly 60 years. Before I came to office, the plant was on its way to shutting down. Thousands of workers feared for their livelihoods. Hope was fading. Then I was elected to office, and we raised the Belvedere repeatedly with auto companies, knowing unions would make all the difference. The UAW worked like hell to keep the plant open and get these jobs back, and together we succeeded. Instead of auto factories shutting down, auto factories reopening, the new state-of-the-art battery factories being built to power those cars there at the same time. The folks of Belvedere, I say, instead of your town being left behind, your community is moving forward again. Because instead of watching auto job jobs in the future go overseas, 4,000 union jobs with higher wages are building the future in Belvedere right here in America. Here tonight, is UAW President Sean Fain, a great friend and a great labor leader. Sean, where are you? Stand up. And, and Dawn... And Dawn Sims, a third-generation worker, UAW worker at Belvedere. Sean, I was proud to be the first president to stand on the picket line, and today, Dawn has a good job in her hometown, providing stability for her family and pride and dignity as well. Showing once again, Wall Street didn't build America. They're not bad guys. They didn't build it, though. The middle class built the country, and unions built the middle class. I say to the American people, when America gets knocked down, we get back up. We keep going. That's America. That's you, the American people. It's because of you America's coming back. It's because of you our future is brighter. It's because of you that tonight we can proudly say the state of our union is strong and getting stronger. Tonight, tonight, I want to talk about the future of possibilities that we can build together, a future where the days of trickle-down economics are over and the wealthy and the biggest corporations no longer get the, all the tax breaks. And by the way, I understand corporations. I come from a state that has more corporations invested than every one of your states in the state of the United States combined. And I represented it for 36 years. I'm not anti-corporation, but I grew up in a home where trickle-down economics didn't put much on my dad's kitchen table. That's why I determined to turn things around so middle class does well. 
When they do well, the poor of a way up and the wealthy still do very well. We all do well. And there's more to do to make sure you're feeling the benefits of all we're doing. Americans pay more for prescription drugs than anywhere in the world. It's wrong, and I'm ending it. With a law that I proposed and signed, not one of you Republican buddies worked, voted for it, we finally beat Big Pharma. Instead of paying $400 a month or thereabouts for insulin with diabetes, and it only costs 10 bucks to make, they only get paid 35 a month now and still make healthy profit. And I want to — but what to do next? I want to cap the cost of insulin at $35 a month for every American in Egypt, everyone. For years, people have talked about it, but finally we got it done and gave Medicare the power to negotiate lower prices on prescription drugs, just like the VA is able to do for veterans. That's not just saving seniors' money. It's saving taxpayers' money. We cut the federal deficit by $160 billion. Because Medicare will no longer have to pay those exorbitant prices to Big Pharma. This year, Medicare is negotiating lower prices for some of the costliest drugs on the market to treat everything from heart disease to arthritis. It's now time to go further and give Medicare the power to negotiate lower prices for 500 different drugs over the next decade. They're making a lot of money, guys. And they'll still be extremely profitable. It'll not only save lives, it will save taxpayers another $200 billion. <laughs> Starting next year, the same law caps total prescription drug costs for seniors on Medicare at $2,000 a year, even for expensive cancer drugs that cost ten, twelve, fifteen thousand dollars $15,000. I want to cap prescription drug costs at $2,000 a year for everyone. Yeah. Folks, I'm going to get in trouble for saying that, but if you want to get in Air Force One, we're going to fly to Toronto, Berlin, Moscow. I mean, excuse me. And it, well, even Moscow, probably. And bring your prescription with you, and I promise you, I'll get it for you for 40 percent the cost you're paying now. Same company, same drug, same place. Folks, the Affordable Care Act, the old Obamacare, it's, it's still a very big deal. million of you can no longer be denied health insurance because of pre-existing condition. But my predecessor and many in this chamber want to take this prescription drug away by repealing the Affordable Care Act. I'm not going to let that happen. We stopped you 50 times before and we'll stop you again. In fact, I'm not only protecting it, I'm expanding it. The, we, the enacted tax credits of $800 per person per year reduce health care costs for millions of working families. That tax credit expires next year. I want to make that savings permanent. <laughs> to state the obvious, women are more than half our population. But research on women's health has always been underfunded. That's why we're launching the first ever White House initiative on women's health research, led by Jill, doing an incredible job as First Lady. So, pa so pass my plan for $12 billion to transfer women's health research and benefit millions of lives all across America. <clears throat> I know the cost of housing is so important to you. 
If inflation keeps coming down, mortgage rates will come down as well, and the Fed acknowledges that. But I'm not waiting. I want to provide an annual tax credit that will give Americans $400 a month for the next two years as mortgage rates come down to put toward their mortgages when they buy their first home or trade up for a little more space. Just for two years. And my administration is also eliminating title insurance on federally backed mortgages. When you refinance your home, you can save $1,000 or more as a consequence. For millions of renters, we're cracking down on big landlords who use antitrust law, using antitrust, who break antitrust laws by price fixing and driving up rents. We've cut red tape so builders can get federally financing, which is already helping build a record 1.7 million new house, housing units nationwide. Now pass. Now pass and build and renovate 2 million affordable homes and bring those rents down. <laughs> to remain the strongest economy in the world, we need to have the best education system in the world. And I, like I suspect all of you, want to give a child, every child, a good start by providing access to preschool for three and four years old. You know, I think I pointed out last year, I think I pointed out last year that children coming from broken homes where there's no books, they're not read to, not spoken to very often start school, kindergarten, or first grade, hearing having heard a million fewer words spoken. Well, studies show that children who go to preschool are nearly 50 percent more likely to finish high school, go on to earn a two- and four-year degree, no matter what their background is. I met a year and a half ago with the leaders of the Business Roundtable. They were mad that I — they were angry. I said, well, they were d discussing <laughs> why I wanted to spend money on education. I pointed out to them, as Vice President, I met with over eight — I think it was 182 of those folks. Don't hold me the exact number. And uh, I asked them what they need most, the CEOs. And you've had the same experience on both sides, Al. They say a better educated workforce, right? So I looked at them, and I say, I come from Delaware. DuPont used to be the eighth largest corporation in the world. And every new inter enterprise they bought, they educated the workforce to that enterprise. But none of you do that anymore. Why are you angry with me, providing you the opportunity for the best educated workforce in the world? And they all looked at me and said, I think you're right. I want to expand high-quality tutoring and summer learning to see that every child learns to read by third grade. I'm also connecting local businesses and high schools so students get hands-on experience and a path to good-paying job whether or not they go to college. And I want to make sure the college is more affordable. Let's continue increasing the Pell Grants to working and middle-class families and increase record investments in HBCUs and minority-serving institutions, including Hispanic institutions. When I was told I couldn't universally just change the way in which we did, dealt with student loans, I fixed two student loan programs that already existed to reduce the burden of student debt for nearly 4 million Americans, including nurses, firefighters, and others in public service. Like Keenan Jones, a public educator from Minnesota, who's here with us tonight. Keenan, where are you? Keenan, thank you. He's educated hundreds of students so they can go to college, 
Now he's able to help, after debt forgiveness, get his own daughter to college. And folks, look. Such relief is good for the economy because folks are now able to buy a home, start a business, start a family. And while we're at it, I want to give public school teachers a raise. And by the way, the first couple of years, we cut the deficit. Now, let me speak to the question of fundamental fairness for all Americans. I've been delivering real results in fiscally responsible ways. We've already cut the federal deficit. We've already cut the federal deficit over a trillion dollars. I signed the bipartisan deal to cut another trillion dollars in the next decade. My goal to cut the federal deficit another three trillion by making big corporations very wealthy finally beginning to pay their fair share. Look, I'm a capitalist. If you want a maker can make a million or millions of bucks, that's great. Just pay your fair share in taxes. A fair tax code. It's how we invest things to make this country great. Health care, education, defense, and so much more. But here's the deal. The last administration enacted a $2 trillion tax cut. Overwhelmingly benefit the top 1 percent, the very wealthy, the biggest corporation, and exploded the federal deficit. They added more to the national debt than any presidential term in American history. Check the numbers. Folks at home, does anybody really think the tax code is fair? No. Do you really think the wealthy and big corporations need another $2 trillion tax break? No. I sure don't. I'm going to keep fighting like hell to make it fair. Under my plan, nobody earning less than $400,000 a year will pay additional penny in federal taxes. Nobody, not one penny. And they haven't yet. In fact, the child tax credit I passed during the pandemic cut taxes for millions of working families and cut child poverty in half. Restore that child tax credit. No child should go hungry in this country. The way to make the tax code fair is to make big corporations and the very wealthy begin to pay their fair share. Remember in 2020, 55 of the biggest companies in America made $40 billion and paid zero in federal income tax. Zero. Not anymore. Thanks to the law I wrote and we signed, big companies have to pay a minimum of 15 percent. But that's still less than working people pay in federal taxes. It's time to raise corporate minimum tax to at least 21 percent. So every big corporation finally begins to pay their fair share. I also want to end tax breaks for big pharma, big oil, private checks, massive executive pay when it's only supposed to be a million, a million dollars that could be deducted. They can pay them 20 million if they want, but deduct a million. End it now. You know, there are 1,000 billionaires in America. You know what the average federal tax is for those billionaires? No. They're making great sacrifices, 8.2 percent. That's far less than the vast majority of Americans pay. No billionaire should pay a lower federal tax rate than a teacher, a sanitation worker, or a nurse. I propose a minimum tax for billionaires at 25 percent, just 25 percent. You know what that would raise? That would raise $500 billion over the next 10 years. And imagine what that could do for America. Imagine a future with affordable child care. Millions of families can get they need to go to work to help grow the economy. Imagine a future with paid leave, 
because no one should have to choose between working and taking care of their sick family member. Imagine, imagine the future of home care and elder care and people living with disabilities so they can stay in their homes and family caregivers can finally get the pay they deserve. Tonight, let's all agree once again to stand up for seniors. Many of my friends on the other side of aisle want to put Social Security on the chopping block. If anyone here tries to cut Social Security, Medicare, or raise the retirement age, I will stop you. The working people, the working people who built this country pay more into Social Security than millionaires and billionaires do. It's not fair. We have two ways to go. Republicans can cut Social Security and give more tax breaks to the wealthy. I will well, that's the proposal. Oh no. You guys don't want another two trillion dollar tax cut? I kind of thought that's what your plan was. Well, that's good to hear. You're not going to cut another $2 trillion to the super wealth. That's good to hear. I'll protect and strengthen Social Security and make the wealthy pay their fair share. Look. Too many corporations raise prices to pad their profits, charging more and more for less and less. That's why we're cracking down on corporations that engage in price gouging and deceptive pricing, from food to health care to housing. In fact, the snack companies think you won't notice if they change the size of the bag and put a hell of a lot fewer <laughs> same, same size bag, put fewer chips in it. No, I'm not joking. It's called shrinkflation. Pass Bobby Casey's bill and stop this. I really mean it. You probably all saw that commercial on Snickers bars. And you get you get to charge the same amount, and you got about I don't know 10 percent fewer Snickers in it. <laughs> Look, I'm also getting rid of junk fees, those hidden fees at the end of your bill that are there without your knowledge. My administration announced we're cutting credit card late fees from $32 to $8. Banks and credit card companies are allowed to charge what it costs them to, in, to instigate the, re, the, the collection. And that's more a hell of a lot, like $8 and 30-some dollars. They don't like it. The credit card companies don't like it. But I'm saving American families $20 billion a year with all the junk fees I'm eliminating. <laughs> Folks at home, that's why the banks are so mad. It's $20 billion in profit. I'm not stopping there. My administration has proposed rules to make cable, travel, utilities, and online ticket sellers tell you the total price up front so there are no surprises. It matters. It matters. And so does this. In November, my team began serious negotiation with a bipartisan group of senators. The result was a bipartisan bill with the toughest set of border security reforms we've ever seen. Oh, you don't think so? Oh, you don't like that bill, huh? That conservatives got together and said it was a good bill? I'll be darned. That's amazing. That bipartisan bill would hire 1,500 more security agents and officers, 100 more immigration judges to help tackle the backload of two million cases, 4,300 more asylum officers, and new policies so they can resolve cases in six months instead of six years now. What are you against? One hundred more high-tech drug detection machines to significantly increase the ability to screen and stop vehicles smuggling fentanyl into America. That's killing thousands of children. 
This bill would save lives and bring order to the border. It will also give me and any new president new emergency authority to temporarily shut down the border when the number of migrants at the border is overwhelming. The Border Patrol Union has endorsed this bill. The Federal Chamber of Commerce is — yeah, yeah. You're saying low. Look at the facts. I know — I know you know how to read. I believe that, given the opportunity for a majority in the House and Senate, would endorse the bill as well, a majority right now. But unfortunately, politics has derailed this bill so far. I'm told my predecessor called members of Congress in the Senate to demand they block the bill. He feels political win. He viewed it as a, would be a political win for me and a political loser for him. It's not about him. It's not about me. I'd be a winner, not really. I. Lincoln, Lincoln Riley, an innocent young woman who was killed by an illegal. That's right. But how many of thousands of people being killed by illegals? To her parents, I say, my heart goes out to you, having lost children myself. I understand. But look, if we change the dynamic at the border, people pay people. People pay these smugglers eight thousand bucks to get across the border because they know if they get by. If they get by and let into the country, it's six to eight years before they have a hearing. And it's worth the, taking the chance of the $8,000. But, but if it's only six months, six weeks, the idea is it's highly unlikely that people will pay that money and gum all that way, knowing that they'll be able to be kicked out quickly. Right. Folks, I would respectfully say, to suggest my, friend, my Republican friends owe it to the American people, get this bill done. We need to act now. And if my predecessor is watching, instead of paying politics, and pressuring members of Congress to block the bill, join me in telling the Congress to pass it. We can do it together, but that's what he apparently hears what he will not do. I will not demonize immigrants saying they are poison in the blood of our country. I will not separate families. <laughs> I will not ban people because of their faith. Unlike my predecessor on my first day in office, I introduced a comprehensive bill to fix our immigration system. Take a look at it, as all these and more. Secure the border. Provide a pathway to citizenship for dreamers. And so much more. But unlike my predecessor, I know who we are as Americans. We're the only nation in the world with a heart and soul that draws from old and new. Home to Native Americans and ancestors have been here for thousands of years. Home to people of every place, from every place on Earth. They came freely. Some came in chains. Some came when famine struck, like my ancestral family in Ireland. Some to flee persecution, to chase dreams that are impossible anywhere but here in America. That's America. And we all come from somewhere, but we're all Americans. <laughs> <coughs> Look, folks, we have a simple choice. We can fight about fixing the border, or we can fix it. I'm ready to fix it. Send me the border bill now. A transformational moment in history happened 58, 59 years ago today in Selma, Alabama. Hundreds of foot soldiers for justice marched across the Edmund Pettus Bridge, named after the Grand Dragon of the Ku Klux Klan, to claim their fundamental right to vote. They were beaten. They were bloody and left for dead. 
Our late friend and former colleague, John Lewis, was on that march. We miss him. But joining us tonight, our other marchers, both in the gallery and on the floor, including Betty Mae Fikes, known as the voice of Selma, the daughter of gospel singers and preachers. She sang songs of prayer and protest on that bloody Sunday to help shake the nation's conscience. Five months later, the Voting Rights Act passed and was signed into law. Thank you. Thank you, thank you, thank you. But 59 years later, there are forces taking us back in time. Voter suppression, election subversion, unlimited dark money, extreme gerrymandering. John Lewis is a great friend to many of us here. But if you truly want to honor him and all the heroes of march with him, then it's time to do more than talk. Pass the Freedom to Vote Act, the John Lewis Voting Rights Act. And stop, stop denying another core value of America, our diversity across American life. Banning books, it's wrong. Instead of erasing history, let's make history. I want to protect fundamental rights. Pass the Equality Act. And my message to transgender Americans, I have your back. Pass the PRO Act for workers' rights. Raise the federal minimum wage, because every worker has a right to a decent living more than eight, seven bucks an hour. We're also making history by confronting the climate crisis, not denying it. I don't think any of you think there's no longer a climate crisis. At least, I hope you don't. I'm taking the most significant action ever on climate in the history of the world. I'm cutting our carbon emissions in half by 2030, creating tens of thousands of clean energy jobs, like the IBW work is building and installing 500,000 electric vehicle charging stations. Conserving 30 percent of America's lands and waters by 2030. And taking action on environmental justice fence line communities smothered by the legacy of pollution. In pattern after the Peace Corps and America Corps, I launched the Climate Corps to put 20,000 young people to work in the forefront of our clean energy future. I'll triple that number in a decade. To state the obvious, all Americans deserve the freedom to be safe. And America is safer today than when I took office. The year before I took office, murder rates went up 30 percent. 30 percent they went up. The biggest increase in history. It was then, through, no, through my American Rescue Plan, which every American voted against, I'm mad at. We made the largest investment in public safety ever. Last year, the murder rate saw the sharpest decrease in history. Violent crime fell to one of its lowest levels in more than 50 years. But we have more to do. We have to help cities invest in more community police officers, more mental health workers, more community violence intervention. Give communities the tool to crack down on gun crime, retail crime, and carjacking. Keep building trust, as I've been doing by taking executive action on police reform and calling for it to be the law of the land. Directing my cabinet to review the federal classification of marijuana and expunging thousands of convictions for the mere possession, because no one should be jailed for simply using or having it on their record. 
take on crimes and domestic violence. I'm ramping up the Federal Enforcement of the Violence Against Women Act that I proudly wrote when I was a senator so we can finally, finally end the scourge against women in America. There are other kinds of violence I want to stop. With us tonight is Jasmine, whose nine-year-old sister Jackie was murdered with 21 classmates and teachers in elementary school in Uvalde, Texas. Very soon after that happened, Jill and I went to Uvalde for a couple of days. We spent hours and hours with each of the families. We heard their message, so everyone in this room and this chamber could hear the same message. The constant refrain, and I was there for hours meeting with every family. They said, do something. Do something. Well, I did do something by establishing the first ever Office of Gun Violence Prevention in the White House, with the Vice President leading the charge. Thank you for doing it. <clears throat> Meanwhile, Meanwhile, my predecessor told the NRA he's proud he did nothing on guns when he was president. Oh. After another shooting in Iowa recently, he said, when asked what to do about it, he said, just get over it. There's his quote, just get over it. I say, stop it. Stop it, stop it, stop it. <clears throat> I'm proud we beat the NRA when I signed the most significant gun safety law in nearly 30 years because of this Congress. We now must beat the NRA again. I'm demanding a ban on assault weapons and high-capacity magazines. Pass universal background checks. None of this. None of this. I taught the Second Amendment for 12 years. None of this violates the Second Amendment or vilifies responsible gun owners. You know, as we manage challenges at home, we're also managing crises abroad, including in the Middle East. I know the last five months have been gut-wrenching for so many people, for the Israeli people, for the Palestinian people, and so many here in America. This crisis began on October 7th with a massacre by a terrorist group called Hamas, as you all know. 1,200 innocent people, women and girls, men and boys, slaughtered after enduring sexual violence. The deadliest day of the, for the Jewish people since the Holocaust, and 250 hostages taken. Here in this chamber tonight are families whose loved ones are still being held by Hamas. I pledge to all the families that we will not rest until we bring every one of your loved ones home. We also <clears throat> We will also work around the clock to bring home Evan and Paul, Americans being unjustly detained by the Russians and others around the world. Israel has the right to go after Hamas. Hamas ended this conflict by releasing hostages, laying down arms, could end it by, by releasing the hostages, laying down arms, and sur surrendering those responsible for October 7th. But Israel has a <coughs> Excuse me, Israel has a added burden because Hamas hides and operates among the civilian population like cowards, under hospitals, daycare centers, and all the like. Israel also has a fundamental responsibility, though, to protect innocent civilians in Gaza. <clears throat> this war. has taken a greater toll on innocent civilians than all previous wars in Gaza combined. More than 30,000 Palestinians have been killed, most of whom are not Hamas. Thousands and thousands of innocents, women and children, girls and boys, also orphaned. Nearly 2 million more Palestinians under bombardment or displacement. Homes destroyed, neighbors in rubble, cities in ruin. 
families without food, water, medicine. It's heartbreaking. I've been working nonstop to establish an immediate ceasefire that would last for six weeks to get all the prisoners released, all the hostages released, to get the hostages home and ease the intolerable and humanitarian crisis and build toward an enduring, a more something more enduring. The United States has been leading international efforts to get more humanitarian assistance to Gaza. Tonight, I'm directing the U.S. military to lead an emergency mission to establish a temporary pier in the Mediterranean on the coast of Gaza that can receive large shipments carrying food, water, medicine, and temporary shelters. No U.S. boots will be on the ground. A temporary pier will enable a massive increase in the amount of humanitarian assistance getting into Gaza every day. <clears throat> And Israel must do its part. Israel must allow more aid into Gaza to ensure humanitarian workers aren't caught in the crossfire. And they're announcing they're going to they're going to have a crossing in northern Gaza. To the leadership of Israel, I say this: humanitarian assistance cannot be a secondary consideration or a bargaining chip. Protecting and saving innocent lives has to be a priority. As we look to the future, the only real solution to the situation is a two-state solution over time. <clears throat> and I say this, as a lifelong supporter of Israel, my entire career, no one has a stronger record with Israel than I do. I challenge any of you here. I'm the only American president to visit Israel in wartime. But there is no other path that guarantees Israel's security and democracy. There is no other path that guarantees Palestinians can live in peace with, po with peace and dignity. And there's no other path that guarantees peace between Israel and all of its neighbors, including Saudi Arabia, with whom I'm talking. Creating stability in the Middle East also means containing the threat posed by Iran. That's why I built a coalition of more than a dozen countries to defend international shipping and freedom of navigation in the Red Sea. I've ordered strikes to degrade the Houthi capability and defend U.S. forces in the region. As Commander-in-Chief, I will not hesitate to direct further measures to protect our people and our military personnel. <clears throat> For years, I've heard many of my Republican and Democratic friends say that China is on the rise and America's falling behind. They've got it backwards. I've been saying it for over four years, even when I wasn't president. America's rising. We have the best economy in the world. And since I've come to office, our GTP is up, our trade deficit with China is down to the lowest point in over a decade. And we're standing up against China's unfair economic practices. We're standing up for peace and stability across the Taiwan Straits. I revitalized our partnership and alliance in the Pacific. India, Australia, Japan, South Korea, the Pacific Islands. I've made sure that the most advanced American technologies can't be used in China, not allowing to trade them there. Frankly, for all this tough talk on China, it never occurred to my predecessor to do any of that. I want competition with China, not conflict. And we're in a stronger position to win the conflict of the 21st century against China than anyone else, for that matter, than any time as well. Here at home, I've signed over 400 bipartisan bills. But there's more to pass my unity agenda. Strengthen penalties on fentanyl trafficking. You don't want to do that, huh? <laughs> pass bipartisan privacy legislation to protect our children online. Harness. Harness the promise of AI to protect us from peril. Ban AI voice impersonations and more. And keep our truly sacred obligation to train and equip those we send into harm's way and care for them and their families when they come home and when they don't. <clears throat> That's why 
the song Support and Help of Dennis and the VA, I signed the PACT Act. One of the most significant laws ever, helping millions of veterans expose the toxins who now are battling more than 100 different cancers. Many of them don't come home, but we owe them and their families support. We owe it to ourselves to keep supporting our new health research agency called ARPA-H. And remind us, remind us that we can do big things like end cancer as we know it, and we will. Let me close with this. Yay. I know you don't want to hear any more, Lindsay, but I got to say a few more things. I know it may not look like it, but I've been around a while. <laughs> when you get to be my age, certain things become clearer than ever. I know the American story. Again and again, I've seen the contest between competing forces and the battle for the soul of our nation, between those who want to pull America back to the past and those who want to move America into the future. My lifetime has taught me to embrace freedom and democracy, a future based on core values that have defined America, honesty, decency, dignity, equality, to respect everyone, to give everyone a fair shot, to give hate no safe harbor. Now, other people my age see it differently. The American story of resentment, revenge, and retribution, that's not me. I was born amid World War II when America stood for the freedom of the world. I grew up in Scranton, Pennsylvania, in Claymont, Delaware, among working-class people who built this country. I watched in horror as two of my heroes, like many of you did, Dr. King and Bobby Cunningham, were assassinated. And their legacies inspired me to pr pr pursue a, cure, a career in service. I left the law firm, became a public defender, because my city of Wilmington was the only city in America occupied by the National Guard after Dr. King was assassinated because of the riots. And I became a county councilman almost by accident. I got elected to the United States Senate when I had no intention of running at age 29, then vice president to our first black president, now president to the first women vice president. <clears throat> In my career, I've been told I was too young. <laughs> By the way, they didn't let me on ascended elevators for votes sometimes. They're not a joke. And I've been told I'm too old. <laughs> Whether young or old, I've always been known, I've always known what endures. I've known our North Star. The very idea of America is that we're all created equal and deserves to be treated equally throughout our lives. We've never fully lived up to that idea but we've never walked away from it either. And I won't walk away from it now. I'm optimistic. I really am. I'm optimistic, Nancy. My fellow Americans, the issue facing our nation isn't how old we are. It's how old are our ideas. Yeah. Hate, anger, revenge, retribution are the oldest of ideas. Yeah. But you can't lead America with ancient ideas that only take us back. If you lead America, the land of possibilities, you need a vision for the future and what can and should be done. Yeah. Tonight, you've heard mine. I see a future where, defending democracy, you don't diminish it. I see a future will restore the right to choose and protect our freedoms, not take them away. I see a future where the middle class has finally has a fair shot and the wealthy have to pay their fair share in taxes. 
I see a future where we save the planet from the climate crisis and our country from gun violence. Above all, I see a future for all Americans. I see a country for all Americans. And I will always be president for all Americans, because I believe in America. I believe in you, the American people. You're the reason we've never been more optimistic about our future than I am now. So let's build the future together. Let's remember who we are. We are the United States of America. And there is nothing, nothing beyond our capacity when we act together. God bless you all, and may God protect our troops. Thank you, thank you, thank you. This is Josh Boak with AP. What we just saw tonight from President Biden was an election year State of the Union. He started his speech by grounding it in history. He said, basically, we've been in this spot with World War II. We've been in this spot with the Civil War. And then he pivoted, as he did frequently throughout the night, to a person he simply called, quote, my predecessor. That individual was Donald Trump, the former U.S. president and Biden's likely opponent in this year's presidential elections. He quoted Trump directly. He spoke about Trump's policies, whether that was on abortion or taxes. And he directly challenged his political rival. What was essential in what Biden did in this State of the Union was not necessarily him trying to extend an olive branch, but him drawing a dividing line between where he stands and where he says Republicans stand. So we saw him challenge the GOP on several fronts. He challenged them on taxes, drawing jeers, by saying that he would raise taxes on the wealthy and corporations while they would cut taxes by two trillion dollars over 10 years. He went against them on Ukraine, saying that he would not walk away from America's responsibilities overseas, but some Republicans, including, quote, my predecessor, end quote, would. This was an example of Biden fine-tuning a message that voters are going to hear for months and months and months as we build to November. Not surprisingly, we saw an enthusiastic response from Democrats. It was almost as though at moments there was a call and response with them saying no when he would ask them a question. And Republicans in return, largely sitting, refusing to clap. In some cases, there was yelling. We saw Marjorie Taylor Greene, the Georgia Congresswoman, put on a Donald Trump Make America Great Again red cap. And she at one point said that the president's son Hunter should pay his taxes. But beyond that, this was Welcome a Welcome back to Inside 2024. I'm Alyssa Mastromonaco, host of Hysteria and former Obama White House Deputy Chief of Staff. What a mouthful. In the run-up to Biden's State of the Union address on March 7th, I'm talking to our dear John Favreau and Obama's chief speechwriter, fellow SOTU writer, professor at Northwestern University, and New York Times best-selling author of Grace, President Obama, and 10 Days in the Battle of America, Cody Keenan. Cody, you got, but what a, what a fancy title. <laughs> it's I nice, right? Titles. New York Times bestselling. I got two New York Times bestselling authors on the- uh, You do. On this it's, right a, it's a fun party. All I care is that you make it one time, and it's on your uh, tombstone forever. Um <laughs> Okay, bros. So we're here to talk about so too. I am older than both of you, but I know we all grew up with some period of our adolescence, in my case, the entirety of it, with only network television, where every single show would be interrupted for the president's State of the Union. I watched it every year. I was always riveted, no matter the president. 
when the sergeant at arms announces Mr. Speaker, the President of the United States. Into the chamber, goosebumps again, don't care who the president is. So we're here to talk about the State of the Union. And for anyone listening, I am just going to give a little level set. A State of the Union address fulfills the requirement in Article 2, Section 3, Clause 1 of the U.S. Constitution for the president to periodically give to the Congress information of the State of the Union and recommend to their consideration such measures as he shall judge necessary and expedient. You know, I thought at some point reading that it would be outdated, the he part, but we're still he in, so that's okay. <laughs> it is usually timed with the president submitting the budget to Congress. I love a so too, and you two have both written many, so we are going to get into it. Fabs, aside from it being constitutionally, you know, required, why do presidents do a State of the Union? I don't know. Uh, <laughs> I don't know anymore. <laughs> no. They do it because it is one of the, if not the biggest audience you get every year. Um, you know, millions of people tune in. Even now, millions of people still tune in to State of the Union addresses, uh, even at a time where uh, millions of people don't tune in to any one thing. So it is at a, at a time where it's harder for presidents to get their message uh, to the broadest audience possible. The State of the Union is still your opportunity to do that and to talk to the American people directly without the filter of the media. That's that's why they do it, I think. Okay, so that's your answer. Coco, do they actually have impact and or are they important? It's it's the most work of any speech for the shortest tale of import and meaning. I mean, Favs is right. I, I saw a chart a few weeks ago. I actually did Favs center around uh, where like the top 100 TV shows last year were all NFL games, except for the State of the Union Address, which was like number 97 or something. So it is the biggest audience he'll get. It is your chance to... Like, I was thinking about today whether or not I miss doing it or not. Um, and I sort of do because it's it's the one time where you get a big audience and you can you can take, like, however fractured the country is, however frustrated people are, however confusing things are, you can tell a story that tries to get everyone kind of on the same page. You're setting a course for the country. Um, on the other hand, I don't miss it at all. I was going to say, are you crazy? <laughs> <laughs> it's so funny. I just went through the whole range of emotions because I started being like, you know what, maybe Cody's right. Maybe it would be, and then as you kept talking, I was like, no, I would fucking hate it if I was doing it right now. It'd be so miserable. Yeah. <laughs> it's so miserable. It's so miserable. I mean, look at that. We, I can't believe we, we wrote eight of them, yeah. uh, and here we are 10 years later talking about them on the internet. I know, we've really come a long way. But Fabs, I assume you went a couple times. <laughs> I went to two, and I stayed at my desk for two, and uh, I, would, I would rather stay at my desk. I would rather have like beer and chicken fingers and not have to go sit there for an hour and a half. That is what I did. If I was a cabinet secretary, though, then you get a good seat. I went a couple times and I had to stand in the back. And then every time people like stand up to applaud, you can't see anything. So it was just I didn't see anything when I was there. It was like cool to say that you went and to be to have gone and done the experience. But like, yeah, no, I think it's it's better to better to sit. Abzir actually, who told me not to go. Yeah, like you knew of my affection of wanting like loving state of the unions and you're like Alyssa I say this with so much love but you're too short you'll you won't see anything so wait Cody let's start with you how do you begin to tackle talking about everything right because that's really what a state of the union is so how do you organize yeah. your thoughts but there are a couple different answers to this one is we had we usually had a point person every year the, the four years I was lead on it I had Brian Deese who was amazing Pfeiffer did it the first year I did it who was amazing and, and they're, they kind of corral the cabinet, right? The cabinet is right. like, here's every idea we have. And they'll kind of corral them all into 200 or so ideas. Um, and then we would actually like put a poll out in the field testing those ideas. And it doesn't mean we're going to take them all. It doesn't mean we're going to take the top right. 20 or whatever. You find out what's good or what's bad. And then ultimately, we would just kind of sit down and, and whittle down what are the best ones, knowing that some more might come along. But but you like any other speech, you try to think of what's the story we want to tell. And it's so hard in a state of the union dress. It's like, what's the story you want to tell with 60 different policy items? Right. Do you try to come up with buckets, um, economy, foreign policy, you know, in later years we had climate change. Uh, Obama always liked the better politics ending. And you just sort of like try to drop everything into those buckets and then tie them all together into one theme. And that's the hardest part. That takes like, right. that ruined our Christmas every year. 
Uh, oh, yeah. You would just go like sit alone for a week and write the State of the Union address. And, and I, you know, the only reason I knew I was capable of taking over after Fabs left was that I had gotten those emails from him at two in the morning for four <laughs> straight years being like, I want to quit. I can't do this. I'm leaving tomorrow. Like, and I felt the same way. I was like, all right, John felt this way. Okay. Fabs, when you started, it was when you, the first state of the union, you had only known some of these policy people and cabinet secretaries for like a minute. Yeah. And, um, in the middle of a financial crisis, stock market in free fall, hundreds of thousands of jobs gone. And, uh, Guess, uh, guess which speechwriter didn't take an econ class in college? This guy. Oh, uh, yeah. So I I had to sit down with uh, Larry Summers, who was every bit as Larry Summers as you can imagine. Uh, Larry Bear to me. <laughs> right. But he was, I remember the first time I like went into his office, he, he was like a the, the Harvard professor that he once was. And he would like look at something I wrote and he was like, this is actually pretty okay. <laughs> That was Larry's first. But anyway, so I would talk to him and then Tim Geithner, the sec- the Treasury yep. Secretary. And honestly, like Tim, Larry, uh, Gene Sperling, uh, Austin Goolsby, they would they sort of taught they gave me like a crash course in economics <laughs> so that I could explain the financial crisis via Barack Obama and the State of the Union to the American people. And it was sort of an interesting back and forth because they had all the knowledge and the policy knowledge. And that I would have to figure out how to translate that so that anyone who was watching the State of the Union could understand what the hell the president was saying, uh, even if they, like me, had not taken an economics class. Uh, because, again, the purpose is not to just be, like, the smartest person possible when you're giving a speech. It's to, like, actually reach people and connect with them. So that was sort of the challenge. That was the challenge for the first one. Listen, that 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 had to be the worst uh, for, for so many reasons. I mean, half the staff wasn't even like cleared yet half of treasury like wasn't even on the job we barely knew where the bathrooms were i wasn't even cleared for the west wing like i had a green badge you know yeah oh shit and and, and so favs is doing this on his own while the rest of us are writing all the other speeches because obama's still out there giving you know two speeches a day on like here's how we're gonna fix the housing crisis here's how we're gonna fix the small business lending crisis like i was here so we're gonna create jobs and we're all trying to figure that out too but poor favs is like stuck figured out that whole thing and over the, over the eight years it gets easier obviously right. for a whole host of reasons but towards the end it could, it could uh the process i was gonna say it could almost be fun which isn't true but there there are funny parts of it like i walk into my office one morning and there's a bottle of bourbon on my desk with a note that just says like don't forget the department of education <laughs> you know it just <laughs> that's it just, a m- the good fuck no one did that to me no one gave me a bottle of bourbon you know why I it's I because you never put the department of education in there like you gotta try a new <laughs> tack here second term's easier can we talk about what happens almost inevitably at the beginning of every state of the union process at least what happened Please. to us is yes we would uh sit down with the president and uh at least in the early years it would be david axelrod then it was pluff and david pluff and then it's pfeiffer but we would all we'd have this discussion and we'd say, you know what? These speeches are so long and they are so boring and they end up as just laundry lists of policy and applause line and, and people stand up, one party stands up and then sits down and then they don't clap and it's, all, it's so formulaic. What if, what if this year, this year we did something different that no one's ever done before? And Barack Obama goes up there and he just gives a crisp 10 minute speech that is more about like, where the country is and where he wants to take it and it's short and it's and it's emotional and inspiring what if we just did that and we're all like yeah let's do it let's do it this is great and then the the process starts and we find out all the reasons that we can't do that because he has to announce this policy initiative or he has to talk about this foreign policy issue or he has to do this and has to do this political thing and it just goes on and on and on and then suddenly there's a moment in each state of the union process where we're like well, it's just going to be typical like all the other State of the Union speeches. Keeping it under an hour. Yeah, we're just, yeah, exactly. We're just trying to keep it under an hour. That's where we're at now. It's such it's such a good point because we did have that conversation every year. Like we were like, can we just make this, we'll do a one <laughs> topic so to on climate change. You know, one year we floated, well, what if we go somewhere? Like what if we go to Ohio and yeah. do it like a basketball arena open to the I public? I remember that. And the networks all flat out said, well, we're not going to carry it. Like, because that's just a campaign rally <laughs> and we're not going to cover it. So inertia takes over and in our defense even president donald trump who is supposed to be different and shake things up all of his state of the union addresses were completely formulaic and he read them off a teleprompter 
and like while the policies behind it were odious and terrible it sounded just like any other state of the union address i mean like much much worse but it was the most normal thing about him and you could tell he was he was like a prisoner yeah. while reading it off yeah. the teleprompter <laughs> he's sure. like what is this i hate this for sure here's my question for you guys though not diminishing your talents how much of a good so to is a function of being a good orator this is not diminishing our talents because i think it it is not a function of having good speech writers. I really believe that because I think that um, because every state of the union is so formal formulaic, you it, whether you're a good speech writer or not, like it ends up being, you know, s somewhat similar. I do think it's a function of being a good orator because the only the only way you can sort of break out of the of the formulaic state of the union speech is by, you know, showing emotion, uh, telling some jokes, right? Like it it really is the only thing that could differentiate a state of the union is the performance of the yeah. president themselves. I, like, I, I, I think it's different than just the, the writing of it. Because I do have to say, I asked that because I went back and I watched several of your states of the union, state of the unions, states of the union, whichever. What did you set aside? What did you set aside like a week? Look, I, I've had a hard time sleeping. And so I took my <laughs> edible. I fired up one of your so tooth uh, yeah. and I got to bed. I could listen to my edibles. I will say POTUS, our POTUS, really did try out some of his best improv at yeah, the states of the union because he loved he had the best timing like i'm not sure i've seen anybody else like when they're all they start to go after him or he talks about how it's his last election do you guys remember this when he says the note he's like well this is my last election and the republicans started I to clap no more campaigns to run my only agenda <laughs> i know because i won both of them and I was like, dang, I Boom. about that. Boom. Yeah, that was great. It was fantastic. How old were you, uh, Fabs, when you worked on the first State of the Union? Uh, I was 27. Did you feel like you had seen enough life to really sort of uh, harness <laughs> that monster? Uh, you know, I, I wasn't, wor I was worried about dealing with all of the, like you said, all the cabinet secretaries and people who were like, just had so much more experience and knowledge than me. And like, but I also knew that what was most important about a state of the union is that like people listen to it and process mm -hmm. it and, and feel like they connect with it, or at least they don't shut it off after five seconds, <laughs> just very low bar. And so like knowing that that's what Obama wanted and, uh, and that's what Axe wanted, it like helped me deal with all the policy people. And that sort of was the case throughout the time that I was at the White House, and I'm sure Cody was the same way, although Cody was much nicer to people than I was. That's true. I think it's because we all sat subterranean in the West Wing for a great portion of this. I mean, when you don't see natural sunlight for a great portion of the day, like, what are you supposed to do? Yeah, yeah. You know what's great? Is there, were, there were two State of the Union address processes where Fast and I shared an office. Mm -hmm. I think we followed you into it. It was, it was, it was in the West Wing, ground floor, but it had windows. Yep. It was Alyssa's office, yeah. Yeah, it was yeah. my office. Yeah, the two of us sat every two years, and and those processes were fun. Uh, I remember, like, as as they went on, I, I mean, I put fun in quotation marks. As they went on, like, more and more clip art went onto our office door that we would close every day. Mm -hmm. Like, memes, we had, like, a poster of Pfeiffer wanting to know where the speech was. <laughs> yeah, um, I forgot about we had, like, that. A, we had, like, a skull and crossbones, and we only our friends were allowed to come in for, like, two yes. weeks. And that was a good time. And then Fabs left, and I got shunted back to... The original office which had no windows like under the oval for four years and my door was even though i was nicer i would put up the same skull and crossbones and i had like a joy meter that my assistant was in charge of doing and it was like you can enter if the meter is like pointing at a happy face if it's pointing at a sad face go away do you know what, what people don't really realize is that between you guys and speech writing before i became deputy chief of staff i was director of scheduling in advance we were all on the same floor we were the people that everybody wanted something from every day. Mm -hmm. And so we had no choice but to put skulls and crossbones on our uh, office doors for a great part of it. And when nobody got a bitter, bigger kick out of it than Barack Obama when he would come down to see us. That's right. Yeah, when you're writing the State of the Union address, you are the most coveted person in Washington for two weeks. And then the second it's delivered, nobody cares about you anymore mm -hmm. for the next year. Yeah. Yeah.
the Senate. I'm worried about their future and the future of children in every corner of our nation. And that's why I invited you into our home tonight. Like so many families across America, my husband Wesley and I just watched President Biden's State of the Union address from our living room. And uh, what we saw was the performance of a permanent politician who has actually been in office for longer than I've been alive. One thing was quite clear though, President Biden just doesn't get it. He's out of touch. Under his administration, families are worse off, our communities are less safe, and our country is less secure. I just wish he understood what real families are facing around kitchen tables just like this one. You know, this is where our family has tough conversations. It's where we make hard decisions. It's where we share the good, the bad, and the ugly of our days. It's where we laugh together, and it's where we hold each other's hands and pray for God's guidance. And many nights, to be honest, it's where Wesley and I worry. I know we're not alone. And so tonight, the American family needs to have a tough conversation because the truth is, we're all worried about the future of our nation. The country we know and love seems to be slipping away and it feels like the next generation will have fewer opportunities and less freedoms than we did. I worry my own children may not even get a shot at living their American dreams. My American dream allowed me, the daughter of two small business owners from rural enterprise, Alabama, to be elected to the United States Senate at the age of 40. Growing up, sweeping the floor at my dad's hardware store and cleaning the bathroom at my mom's dance studio, I never could have imagined what my story would entail. To think about what the American dream can do across just one generation, in just one lifetime. It's truly breathtaking. But right now, the American dream has turned into a nightmare for so many families. The true unvarnished state of our union begins and ends with this. Our families are hurting. Our country can do better. And you don't have to look any further than the crisis at our southern border to see it. President Biden inherited the most secure border of all time. But minutes after taking office, he suspended all deportations, he halted construction of the border wall, and he announced a plan to give amnesty to millions. We know that President Biden didn't just create this border crisis. He invited it with 94 executive actions in his first 100 days. When I took office, I took a different approach. I traveled to the Del Rio sector of Texas. That's where I spoke to a woman who shared her story with me. She had been sex trafficked by the cartels starting at the age of 12. She told me not just that she was raped every day, but how many times a day she was raped. The cartels put her on a mattress in a shoebox of a room and they sent men through that door over and over again for hours and hours on end. We wouldn't be okay with this happening in a third world country. This is the United States of America, and it is past time, in my opinion, that we start acting like it. President Biden's border policies are a disgrace. This crisis is despicable. And the truth is, it is almost entirely preventable. From fentanyl poisonings to horrific murders, 
There are empty chairs tonight at kitchen tables just like this one because of President Biden's senseless border policies. Just think about Lake and Riley. In my neighboring state of Georgia, this beautiful 22-year-old nursing student went out on a jog one morning, but she never got the opportunity to return home. She was brutally murdered by one of the millions of illegal border crossers President Biden chose to release into our homeland. Y'all, as a mom, I can't quit thinking about this. I mean, this could have been my daughter. This could have been yours. And tonight, President Biden finally said her name, but he refused to take responsibility for his own actions. Mr. President, enough is enough. Innocent Americans are dying and you only have yourself to blame. Fulfill your oath of office, reverse your policies, end this crisis and stop the suffering. Sadly, we know that President Biden's failures don't stop there. His reckless spending dug our economy into a hole and sent the cost of living through the roof. We have the worst inflation in 40 years and the highest credit card debt in our nation's history. Let that sink in. Hardworking families are struggling to make ends meet today and with soaring mortgage rates and sky high childcare cost. They're also struggling to how to plan for tomorrow. The American people are scraping by while President Biden proudly proclaims that Bidenomics is working. Goodness, y'all, bless his heart, we know better. I'll never forget stopping at a gas station in Chilton County one evening. The gentleman working the counter told me that after retiring, he had to pick up a job in his 70s so that he didn't have to choose between going hungry or going without his medication. He said, I, I did everything right. I did everything I was told to do. I worked hard, I saved, I was responsible. He's not alone. I hear similar concerns from fellow parents, whether I am walking with my friends or whether I'm at my kids' games. But let's be honest, it's been a minute since Joe Biden pumped gas, uh, ran a carpool, or even pushed a grocery cart. Meanwhile, the rest of us see our dollar and we know it doesn't go as far. We see it every day. And despite what he tells you, our communities are not safer. For years, the left has coddled criminals and defunded the police, all while letting repeat offenders walk free. The result is tragic, but foreseeable. From our small towns to America's most iconic city streets, life is getting more and more dangerous. And unfortunately, President Biden's weakness isn't just hurting families here at home. He is making us a punchline on the world stage. Look, where I'm from, your word is your bond. But for three years, the president has demonstrated that America's word doesn't mean what it used to. From abandoning our allies in his disastrous withdraw from Afghanistan, to desperately pushing another dangerous deal with Iran. President Biden has failed. We've become a nation in retreat. And the enemies of freedom, they see an opportunity. Putin's brutal 
aggression in Europe has put our allies on the brink. Iran's terrorist proxies have slaughtered Israeli, Jews, and American citizens. They've targeted commercial shipping, and they've attacked our troops nearly 200 times since October, killing three US soldiers and two Navy SEALs. Meanwhile, the Chinese Communist Party is undercutting America's workers. China is buying up our farmland, spying on our military installations, and spreading propaganda through the likes of TikTok. You see, the CCP knows that if it conquers the minds of our next generation, it conquers America. And what does President Biden do? Well, he bans TikTok for government employees, but creates an account for his own campaign. Y'all, you can't make this stuff up. Look, we all recall when presidents faced national security threats with strength and resolve. That seems like ancient history. Right now, our commander in chief is not in command. The free world deserves better than a dithering and diminished leader. America deserves leaders who recognize that secure borders, stable prices, safe streets, and a strong defense are actually the cornerstones of a great nation. Just ask yourself, are you better off now than you were three years ago? There's no doubt we're at a crossroads and it doesn't have to be this way. We all feel it. But here's the good news. We, the people, are still in the driver's seat. We get to decide whether our future will grow brighter or whether we'll settle for an America in decline. Well, I know which choice our children deserve, and I know the choice the Republican Party is fighting for. We are the party of hardworking parents and families, and we want to give you and your children the opportunities to thrive. And we want families to grow. It's why we strongly support continued nationwide access to in vitro fertilization. We wanna help loving mom 